Being a star ain't as sexy as it sounds. I want to gloat and glow, but I put on 13 pounds. Good. I just look at myself in the mirror sometimes, and I just, I, I don't know, I just think like, oh, you're just such a stupid fat bitch. I don't know if you guys noticed, but um, I am what Hollywood calls very fat. Uh, in the 2018 film, I Feel Pretty, Renee Bennett, played by Amy Schumer, works as a website manager for a cosmetics firm, Lily LeClaire. We learn that Renee is deeply insecure about how she looks. Right from the beginning, we are meant to believe that Renee has an unconventional body type. Almost everyone in the movie treats Renee as if she is just this hideous monster. The movie also emphasizes this point by casting every other woman whom Renee envies to be a size 2 and lower. Put a pin in that. She and her friends Vivian and Jane, played by Aidy Bryant and Busy Phillips, are also coded as regular ugly losers who don't have pretty privilege and don't get picked on dating sites. Renee meets Emily, a very conventionally attractive woman whom Renee assumes has it so easy due to her looks. We see a scene of Renee trying to shop at a skinny person store and being told by one of the employees that... Um, so sizing is a little limited here in the store, but you could probably find your size online. Not this movie trying to gaslight me into thinking that Amy Schumer is fat. Oh lord. Renee wants to be a receptionist at Lily LeClaire, which is a pretty person job, and since Renee does not feel she is pretty, she makes a wish at a fountain to be beautiful. The next day, while at Soul Cycle, which is apparently a real thing, I didn't even know what that was until I watched this movie. But anyway, while riding on the exercise bike, one of the pedals comes off and Renee falls, hits her head, and a piece of her hair is ripped out. I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a fat joke or not. In the opening scene of the movie where Renee is riding on the bike for the first time, the seat breaks and causes her pants to tear in the middle. I don't understand why this isn't grounds to sue Soul Cycle for their faulty equipment, which like I said later causes Renee to hit her head and possibly cause a concussion. But this isn't ever addressed, which makes me think that this is supposed to be a joke about her body, like, oh, she's so fat that she broke the exercise bike. Even if, say, she was actually fat, you should probably fix your exercise equipment so people aren't out here getting concussions and embarrassing themselves in front of a large group of people. Just a thought. After Renee comes to, she wakes up with a new perception on how she looks. Look at me! Why am I jawline? No, no, I, 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 always, I always wanted this to happen. I, you, you dream that this will happen, but I never thought it would really happen. I mean, look at me! Look at my boobs! Look at my ass! Beautiful. The logic around this part of the movie really doesn't make a lot of sense. Renee seems to think she is a completely different person, referring to her abs as rock hard at one point when they clearly aren't. But everyone in the movie obviously isn't seeing any physical difference in Renee. Renee honestly feels that no one will recognize her, but her friends Vivian and Jane never tell her that she looks exactly the same. Regardless, Renee decides to apply for the receptionist position at Lily LeClaire. She is interviewed by Avery LeClaire, played by Michelle Williams, who for some reason is doing an extremely grating Marilyn Monroe accent. We need to get people used to seeing our products, not just at Saks and Benzels, but also at Target and Cahoos. I've read a few reviews for this movie and people seem to be split on Michelle's accent. Some people think it's brilliantly funny and some people felt it was horribly awkward. I'm going to go with the latter. Renee gives a very confident interview and ends up getting the job. Renee appears to be taking her receptionist job a little too seriously, and everyone who comes into Lily LeClaire is so confused as to why someone who looks like Renee will be a receptionist at this firm. Again, really hammering home the point that Renee is ugly. She meets a guy named Ethan while picking up laundry, and the two go on a date. Renee sees that a bikini contest is happening at the bar that they attend and decides to participate in it. This scene to me really encapsulates everything that is wrong with this movie. It doesn't seem like the writers of this movie really knew what they wanted this movie to be. Like, is this supposed to be a positive movie about a woman learning to love herself and how she looks? Because if it is, then why are you then writing a whole scene where we're supposed to be laughing at Renee, showing off her body, and dancing sexily to a song? I thought we were supposed to be on her side. 
It reminds me of Shallow How, another terrible movie, where the movie wants to pretend to have this heartfelt message about looking skin deep, but still wants to make those horrific fat jokes at fat people's expense. Renee doesn't win the bikini competition, surprise, surprise. See a scene between Renee and Avery where Avery talks about how people don't take her seriously due to her high-pitched voice. This is one of two scenes in the movie where Renee realizes that hot women, get this, have problems. She and Ethan go on a picnic date where Ethan tells her that he thinks she's perfect and that he loves her confidence. Later, she and Ethan go to a work dinner with Avery's brother, Grant, and her mother, Lily. And this word conversation takes place. Oh my God, it, is that Hidden Valley? Only the best, my dear. Oh, oh my God, that is my absolute favorite. KFC actually uses HV, but nobody knows because they put it in their like KFC packaging. Do, do you want me to grab you some next time I'm in there? A couple of the small packets? I don't understand. Renee tells Lily that luxury brands need to do better at appealing to regular people, AKA poor people. Lily says that Avery's life experience is what prevents her from being able to connect with poor people. As if she also isn't a rich white woman, like, okay, mom. Avery's mom and brother treat her like she's separate from them, even though they're all related and they're all rich. I don't get it. Avery then invites Renee to a business in Boston where their firm is going to be giving a key presentation on their diffusion line. We see Renee being incredibly rude and judgmental towards her friends for not being hot enough. Avery tells Renee that she wants her to be VP of their diffusion line. Avery's brother Grant comes on to Renee and she tells him... I'm wet. Excuse me? With diarrhea. After having a moment in the bathroom, she hits her head on the shower door and loses her magical confidence. This is where the movie tries to be really deep and they make it seem super dramatic that she no longer feels pretty, but it just doesn't do anything for me. This movie is so poorly written. Renee tries to hide from Ethan, assuming that if he sees her, he'll be disgusted by her appearance. And then this dumb scene happens. All you have is a pack of gum, please. Oh wait, why her? What about me? I'm standing right here. All I have is this cookie. Is it because she's so beautiful? I, I didn't even see you. He says he didn't see her, but how? She's clearly standing right behind him. This movie tries so hard to be funny. Like, it really tries. Renee goes to visit her friends and they tell her that they never cared about how she looked. And Renee doesn't seem to understand why they're mad at her and continues to make everything about her looks. Renee breaks up with Ethan because she feels that he deserves better than her and I don't disagree. Ethan is truly one of the best rom-com love interests I've ever seen. He's so sweet and kind and I just love him. Renee goes back to Soul Cycle and tries to recreate the moment where she hit her head. Renee sees Emily crying in the locker room and is shocked to learn that Emily was dumped by her boyfriend because she feels that someone so hot wouldn't have to deal with things like that. The acoustics in here are, are weird. It sounds like you were saying you got dumped. Someone said to you, I don't want to see you anymore, ever again. I don't want to have sex with you again. Some, somebody told you, you got dumped? She's also shocked that Emily has struggles with low self-esteem and tells her that knowing that hot people have problems makes her feel better about herself. Yes, that's actually what she says. It's just, you getting dumped is making me feel like I might be okay. Renee calls Vivian and leaves a voicemail apology. She and her coworker Mason sneak into Lily LeClaire's presentation and Renee takes over to give a speech. As she gives her presentation, she realized there was no magic. This is supposed to be another deep moment, but it does not translate that way because this movie is terrible. Renee then gives an interesting speech about how women start off as being confident and free as children and as we grow up, we are solely conditioned to hate how we look. It's the only part of the speech that felt effective until... We are real women. Believe me. But this line is for every girl who is ready to believe in herself. Wait, is this a dove ad? You are beautiful. You are everything. And you are the real face of this line. And we are all the face of Lily LeClaire. Oh no, it's the movie, okay. 
Renee then goes back to Ethan's apartment and apologizes to him and they make up. And the movie ends with Renee back at Soul Cycle, Soul Cycling to a Lizzo song. How dare they? This movie doesn't deserve Lizzo. <sighs> I think one of the most frustrating things about this movie is that there's a good movie hidden in here, but it just couldn't make its way out. This movie felt like a rough draft, like they needed a couple more rewrites and maybe not so much product placement. I will never forgive them for that Hidden Valley scene. It's just unforgivable. The concept is interesting. The conversation the movie was trying to evoke was interesting, but it just did it so poorly. It was also frustrating this movie trying to convince us that Amy Schumer is fat. This is not new. This isn't the first time Hollywood has tried to convince us that hot actors wearing baggy clothes or glasses with ponytails were somehow ugly. Hollywood has a long history of trying to code otherwise fine-looking actors as ugly. The one subsection of that is coding thin actors as fat. From Ethel Mertz in I Love Lucy, to Jan in Grease, to Bridget Jones in Bridget Jones' Diary. During the 1990s, the heroin chic body type was the body ideal of that era. Popularized by fashion photographer David Sorrenti, the heroin chic aesthetic was a huge part of grunge culture. Julie Lillis in an article for Buffalo News says, The heroin chic look was derivative of a realist aesthetic. The seemingly unkept appearances of the model acted as a rebellious cry to the notion of imposing proper beauty. The aesthetic consisted of waif-like emaciated women with pale skin, stringy hair, and dark circles underneath their eyes. The heroin chic look was highly controversial at the time due to its glamorization of drug use. But it also led to young girls wanting to aspire to a specific body ideal. In an article for Harper's Bazaar, Are the 90s Responsible for Our Filter-Obsessed Generation? Tristan Lee says, I grew up in the 90s when heroin chic was something to aspire to. We were consistently fed images of underweight models, and the weekly magazines were awash with articles on how to be a size zero. I read about bulimia in one particular magazine and decided that was how I was going to achieve this unrealistic goal. I was just 13 years old. She continues saying, Some of us felt firsthand what that crash felt like, desperately wanting to look like the women in the magazines that I obsessively read from cover to cover. I took measures into my own hands not realizing that these measures would take me on an agonizing 12-year journey with lifelong repercussions. The heroin chic trend wasn't actually about drugs for many of us. It was the thin idea that we were hooked on and that then media happily facilitated it. The fashion industry has been promoting unrealistic standards of beauty since its inception. Young people then idolizing these unrealistic body types and then wanting to emulate those bodies is almost like a rite of passage from young teenage girls. No matter how many articles and think pieces are written for how unrealistic and unattainable these bodies are, we still find ourselves in the mirror, scrutinizing our bodies and measuring ourselves up against these models. These models whom we also know struggled with eating disorders and dabbled in extremely unhealthy practices as a means to keep their size zero bodies. The late Isabel Caro, who was a French model, appeared in a controversial ad campaign in 2007 for an Italian fashion house. The ad read, No Anorexia, with Isabel's naked and emaciated body across billboards and newspapers. The problem with the way our society props up these body types is that anything that deviates from the body type that we have decided every woman should have is deemed as abnormal. In a newsletter for Substack, Anne Helen Peterson talks about a 1993 issue from Seventeen magazine where the body of a thin woman on the cover was referred to as non-ideal and relatable by some of its readers. She highlighted three letters to the editor for the issue, which I find very interesting. Being at college has taken its toll on our self-esteem, and constantly seeing bikini-clad beauties hasn't helped. When we caught a glimpse of June cover model Alexa Luxfield, cheers of relief filled the hallways. Just thought we'd share our enthusiasm. We just wanted to thank you for putting a normal person, someone who we are sure indulges in birthday cake and forgets to do their step aerobics from time to time, on the June cover. Hopefully images like this will change the stereotypical body type both males and females feel girls must conform to. Many magazines are aware that girls are obsessed with achieving a super skinny body and even write articles about it. Yet they still use super skinny models. 
We hope that other magazines will follow your example, and we hope that you will continue to use pretty models with bodies that hide their bones. We noticed that the June cover model looks different from other successful models. We feel that if you're going to put a model in a bikini on the cover, she should have a better figure. You realize that you may be trying to change society's opinions of the ideal physique of a woman, but frankly, it's too late. Damn. So I guess since you couldn't see the model's ribs, that somehow means her body is normal and apparently made some of the readers at the time feel seen and also caused the people in that last letter to feel disgusted that she didn't have a better figure. The idea that this very thin woman on the cover of this magazine has a normal body and that her body being on the cover is doing something for everyday women really boggles the mind. This perfectly exemplifies what I am trying to get at in this video. The woman on the cover of this magazine is thin. Her body is what we are told we should aspire to, and yet, at the time, some people felt this wasn't thin enough. Enter the case of Bridget Jones. Bridget Jones and Bridget Jones' Diary is another memorable story of a thin woman being coded as fat. We are told that Bridget Jones is 136 pounds. The movie frames this as shameful since Bridget is a single woman in her mid-30s, who not only desperately wants to find her true love, but also wants to lose weight. See, if this movie was about a woman clearly struggling with body dysmorphia, I think the way we discuss Bridget Jones' weight shaming would be different. Except, that's not what's happening here. We are meant to think that Bridget Jones is fat. Oh yay, another mirror scene of a not fat woman wearing shapewear. Sophie Vershbo in an article for Vogue says, when I watch the movie now, I'm struck by the lengths to which it goes to link Bridget's weight with her overall health and lifestyle. When Bridget is happy, drinking less, and smoking less, her weight is lower. But scenes of her drunken and alone are often accompanied by a voiceover telling us that her number has gone up. Fatness has long been defined as a moral failing, based only on willpower and self-determination alone, rather than what it really is, a messy combination of genetics, socioeconomic status, nutrition, exercise, and so much more. One movie, of course, should not shoulder the burden of that widespread narrative, but I was curious to what extent Bridget Jones had affected women of my generation. Film Fatales has a really good video discussing the anti-fat bias that pervaded many early 2000s chick flicks. One of the examples she uses is The Devil Wears Prada. Anne Hathaway's character in that movie is portrayed as fat due to being a size 6, not indulging in restrictive diets that teeter on full eating disorders. What was striking to me when I looked up this movie is that the screenwriter for this movie is Aline Brosh McKenna, the same person who co-created and co-wrote The CW's Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend centers around Rebecca Bunch, who was working hard at a New York job, making dough, but it made me blue. One day I was crying a lot, and so I decided to move to West Covina, California. Brand new pals and new career. It happens to be where Josh lives, but that's not why I'm here. You get it. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is honestly one of the best shows I've ever seen. However, one of the main things about this show that has always bothered me is the way the show talks about Rebecca's body. From the very first episode in one of the show's most popular songs, the Sexy Getting Ready song, which directly references a scene from Bridget Jones' diary, we see Rebecca struggling to put on shapewear, despite the fact that she visibly doesn't have much to struggle with. Remember earlier when I talked about how in I Feel Pretty, the movie wants to emphasize how different Renee's body is by having every other woman she envies be a size 2 and lower? Well, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend does this as well. Josh's girlfriend Valencia is extremely thin and gorgeous. Throughout season 1, Rebecca is shown to be incredibly in awe of her and envious of her skinny body. No legumes, no starches. God, she's so skinny. No wonder Josh loves her. As a way to show Rebecca is an everyday, regular woman, we constantly see Rebecca indulging in food, and we learn that Valencia does not. Valencia low-key, or high-key really, seems to struggle with an eating disorder, and this is made into a joke. She is disgusted by the idea of enjoying sweets or eating after a certain time in the day. Guys, let me remind you, I eat bagels at night. Valencia knows. She knows all about my night bagels. Tell him, V. Here's what you didn't know. For my midnight bagel, I eat it with butter, cream cheese, and bacon. In season two, after being dumped by Josh, we see Valencia's eating, wait for it, carbs. It's literally the name of the episode. Are these muffins? Are you eating carbs? I am so proud of you, girl. I know. I'm super fat. Thanks for reminding me. 
What? No, you're not fat. You're like most people's wedding goal weight. Perpetuating the cruel trope of thin women being terrified of carbs because it causes you to get fat. It was a common and weird trend during the early 2000s when in reality, you need carbs. I shouldn't even have to explain that. Valencia even refers to herself as fat simply because she's now eating stuff that she didn't used to eat. So you really want me to be fat? Valencia, again! You're not fat! Rebecca even calls out her body dysmorphia. I couldn't really tell if the show was trying to be self-aware here or not. Like, the writers are aware that Valencia calling herself fat is ridiculous. But are they also aware that Rebecca being considered fat is also ridiculous? We're learning in an episode from season 2 that Rebecca is a size 6 which I'm sure you can guess is why we are supposed to think that her body is unconventional. I wouldn't have a problem with this if this was a part of Rebecca's arc, that her body dysmorphia was only exacerbated by her overbearing mother, whom we constantly see body shaming with Rebecca. You're looking healthy, and by healthy, I mean chunky. I don't mean that as an insult. I'm just stating it as fact. Getting fatter by the minute on this greasy, gorgeous food job. I'm on a grapefruit diet, but for you, I put some white fish salad in the refrigerator. Becca sometimes likes to eat in the middle of the night, and that's why her weight fluctuates. Okay. Although the ways moms can cause their daughters to develop a body complex is addressed somewhat in the series, still get the sense that the way Rebecca sees herself is the way we should all see her. It's not just the fact that Rebecca thinks she is fat, it's almost every other character in the show who thinks she is fat. Valencia thinks she's fat. I will wear a dress fit to upholster a chair, and I will wear it with pride. <laughs> Becca, come on. Yeah, you're not that disgustingly fat. Oh, thank you, Valencia. No wonder my boobs are so small. I have no fat on my body. Nathaniel thinks her body is unconventional. You look go. Wait a minute, where's the dress I bought you? Oh, right, yes, I donated that to the West Covina Middle School Drama Department because only a 13-year-old girl could fit into it. Well. You do have an unconventional body type. George thinks her body is brave. I don't think anybody would say that. I like your very normal body. I think it's brave. What? Ugh, indeed. For the record, referring to someone having a certain body type as brave is a gross thing to say to anyone, regardless of their size. I noticed the same rhetoric being touted in the HBO series Girls. I know, I know. I know everyone hates Lena Dunham, but I actually really liked the show Girls, and I'm not even a millennial, I just thought the show was neat. Anyway, a big part of Lena Dunham's character, Hannah, is that she's an immature and self-absorbed millennial with deep insecurities about who she is and how she looks. Again, this wouldn't be a problem if the show didn't bash into our heads that Hannah is the fattest person in the whole world. Hey, doesn't Hannah remind you of crazy-ass Sadie? <laughs> Sadie is fat as shit. <laughs> no, you are way skinnier than Sadie, like way skinnier. Not only are we supposed to think she is so fat, we are supposed to see this as a bad thing. There are moments in the first season where it seems the show wants to highlight how insane it is for Hannah to think she is so fat, but this unfortunately isn't delved into further beyond season one. Multiple characters throughout the show seem to feel that Hannah's tiny stomach is revolting. I mean, Elijah, who becomes one of her closest friends throughout the series, is constantly body shaming her. I cannot stress enough how harmful this is. Not only is it perpetuating anti-fat bias, it's also further invoking body dysmorphia in its viewers, something the Hollywood media is not a stranger to. I feel like I, I never saw girls that look like me on TV. The only time was in the, those Dove soap commercials. And they're like my size, like size sixes, eight, ten. And uh, we were all watching like, we don't know if we're cool with this. When I started doing research on all the female celebrities who have been cruelly body shamed by the media, it caused me to become so angry and upset that I had to take a mental health break. From us being told that Jessica Simpson had ballooned and was out of shape, to Kate Winslet being fat shamed in the Titanic, to Britney Spears being fat shamed at the 2007 VMAs, to Kelly Clarkson shocking fans when she gained weight during her pregnancy. <clears throat> to repeat that, Kelly Clarkson was body shamed during her pregnancy. I hate people. We really need to stop shaming women for gaining weight as if they've committed a murder. You could easily Google how many thin actresses were told they were too fat or needed to lose weight. It's sadly not uncommon. Chloe Grace Moretz has spoken about how she was fat shamed at 15 years old. 
by a male actor on the set of a movie. Amanda Seyfried has talked about how she lost a lot of job opportunities due to being too fat. She said, quote, if I didn't run and work out, there's no way I would be this thin. But I have to stay in shape because I'm an actress. It's fucked up and it's twisted, but I wouldn't get the roles otherwise. If I'd been a bit bigger, I don't think they would have cast me for Mamma Mia. In her comedy special on Netflix, Amy Schumer talked about how she was told to lose weight for her breakout movie, Trainwreck. Just so you know, Amy, no pressure. But if you weigh over 140 pounds, it will hurt people's eyes. She talks about how Hollywood considered her to be very fat at over 140 pounds. Allison Tolman has talked about how Hollywood considers her to be very fat, saying on Twitter that she's not fat, she's average. Put a pin in that. I could go on, but we would be here all day. The point I'm making here is that the way Rachel Bloom may have felt about her body or the way Amy Schumer felt about her body in I Feel Pretty or Lena Dunham and Girls isn't born from nothing. People who feel insecure about their bodies, their skin tone, their hair texture is not an individualized problem. It's a problem with our society. It's a problem with the way our society loves to remind people that they are not enough and will never be enough. I am not necessarily angry at Rachel Bloom or Lena Dunham for the way they feel about their bodies. Being angry at someone for having negative thoughts about their bodies is unreasonable and unhelpful. I'm also not implying that thin women are allowed to be insecure about their bodies. Before I Feel Pretty even came out, the movie received immediate backlash. Amy Schumer stated in an article for Vulture, quote, Everyone's got a right to feel that feeling, regardless of their appearance. We all struggle with self-esteem. I certainly have. Your friends who you think are so beautiful, they could be struggling too. You want them to see themselves the way you see them. But it's not our place to say who should be allowed to have low self-esteem. She's absolutely right. There's no weight limit on who can hate their bodies. Obviously, perpetuating that idea is harmful to fat people as well. It presumes that every fat person should be insecure and thin people shouldn't be. As I've stated many times throughout this video, I don't have a problem with a not fat character having low self-esteem. I have a problem with not fat characters being coded as fat and these films and TV shows going to great lengths to emphasize how fat they are. It has a similar effect to the way Hollywood is always willing to cast a thin actor to play a fat character and put them in a fat suit rather than casting an actual fat person. Instead of just casting a fat person to play Renee and I Feel Pretty, we have to cast a straight size actress to play her and have multiple characters in the movie treat her as if she's plus size. What's interesting here is that Amy Schumer seems to be aware of this. In 2016, Amy Schumer was featured in a special issue of Glamour magazine entitled She Get Any Size, an issue that was meant to celebrate women who were sizes 12 and up. Amy Schumer was not happy about this and expressed her unhappiness in an Instagram post saying, quote, I think there's nothing wrong with being plus size, beautiful, healthy women. Plus size is considered a size 16 in America. I go between a size six and an eight. Young girls seeing my body type thinking that it's plus size. What are your thoughts? Mine are not cool glamor, not glamorous. I would have to agree with her here. In the real world, plus size is a size 16 and up, but in the modeling world, plus size is anything that isn't a size two apparently. As much as I understand what Glamour was trying to do here, it is frustrating how excited these kinds of publications get when they find a celebrity who isn't fat but also isn't super thin and wants to prop them up as inspiring. This is precisely one of the biggest problems with the body positive movement. A movement which was created by radical fat activists and was essentially stolen by thin white women who wanted to express how proud they were of their post-pregnancy bodies and stretch marks. Um, will you show the picture? Yeah, that one. Did anyone see that? A couple people. I have stretch marks and I wear a bikini. I have a belly that's permanently flabby from carrying three giant babies and I wear a bikini. My belly button is saggy, which is something I didn't even know was possible before kids. And I wear a bikini. I wear a bikini because I'm proud of this body and every mark on it. Those marks prove that I was blessed enough to carry my babies and that flabby tummy means I worked hard to lose what weight I could. I wear a bikini because the only man whose opinion matters know what I went, knows what I went through to look this way. That same man says he's never seen anything sexier than my body, marks and all. They aren't scars, ladies. They're stripes, and you've earned them. Flaunt that body with pride. 
Aubrey Gorder discusses this in a Medium article saying, Today, body positivity is defined more by thin women's struggles with self-esteem than it is by the radical fat activists who paved the way for it. And now, even as fat activists work toward our own liberation, thinner women are once again asserting themselves as those most oppressed, claiming that their insecurities are internalized fat phobia, both placing themselves at the center of a system that specifically targets fat people and simultaneously speaking over the countless fat people who are deeply constantly impacted by anti-fatness in individuals, public policy, doctor's offices, and more. In 2015, Demi Lovato did a nude, no makeup, no Photoshop photo shoot for Vanity Fair. I'm about to launch an album that finally represents who I truly am. How do I embrace this new chapter in my life? How do I really walk the walk? What does it mean to be confident? It means letting go, being authentic, saying I don't give a fuck and this is who I am. I want to show the side of me that's real, that's liberated, that's free. What if we do a photo shoot where it's totally raw, super sexy, but no makeup, no fancy lighting, no retouching, and no clothing? Let's do it here, let's do it now. At the time, I felt this was really powerful. I've always appreciated Demi's openness with their body image struggles, their history with eating disorders, and their commitment to advocating for body positivity. But like all thin people trying to do body positivity, Demi's positive message still falls short. You have really been very outspoken about body image mm -hmm. and, uh, and that young women should, should kind of be proud of the, their bodies and not be ashamed. And you credit the Kardashians with helping you a lot. And when the Kardashians came on the scene, that was the first time that I really associated curves um, with beauty. And uh, it was just so new to me. And I, I, I remember thinking, wow, that's so cool. And even in a time where I was still struggling with food, I was able to look at Kim's curves and be like, I should really be proud of my curves. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? They were inspired by the Kardashians? Interesting, hmm. Demi has spoken in the past about embracing their curves and not being ashamed of not having a thigh gap. Demi is another example of someone who grew up during the heroin chic size zero era. They felt pressure to be extremely thin and that anything with thick thighs or large breasts was equal to being fat. So I understand why Demi felt doing this photo shoot was doing something for the body positive movement. They literally state in that Ellen interview that they wanted to be the difference. I was, it was in the era of when very, very, very thin people were the popular people in Hollywood. So that's what I had to look up to. And um, after having had my issues with eating, looking back, I thought, you know, I don't, I want to, I want to be the difference. Megan Trainer was catapulted into fame when her hit song, All About That Bass, came out in 2014 and quickly became the mascot for body positivity. Even being revealed as the new face for Full Beauty, an online shop for women above a size 12. Although the message was supposed to be about girls learning to love their bodies, the music video, which was admittedly very cute, only featured one fat person. And Megan Trainer herself is visibly thin. Megan Trainer at the time talked about in an interview for Entertainment Weekly that she was a chubby kid and was told to lose weight by a boy she liked when she was 13. I did have this one boy come up to me that who I like I loved him. I was so in love and he told me, um, you'd be like real hot if you were ten pounds lighter. It did affect you when you were in school. Like I, I know growing up I had an eating disorder. I wasn't strong enough to have an eating disorder actually. Those I I tried to go anorexic for a good three hours. I ate ice and celery, but that's not even anorexic. And I quit. I was like, Ma, can you make me a sandwich? Like immediately. And she was like, Are you okay? I was like, Yeah, I'm just a little lightheaded. But I I was too hungry, I didn't care. I wanted pizza instead of mm. starving myself. I think eating disorders are very real and very, a lot of girls have them. And I'm glad a lot of comments I've gotten are about their, their eating disorders and how my song saved them, mm -hmm. which is crazy, but amazing. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm not gonna pretend that all about that bass wasn't a bop and that I didn't thoroughly enjoy a mega trainer's music during that time. But this is just another egregious example of a thin white woman trying to do body positivity and failing. And before someone objects to this, Aubrey Gordon also talks about this in that same article. None of this means that you and other people who aren't fat can't struggle with your body image. Many do. Nor does it mean that the way you've been made to feel about your body is acceptable. Your suffering is just as real and valid as anyone's. 
but that doesn't mean that your experience is the same as people who are visibly undeniably fat. Those of us who are kicked off airplanes, even as paying customers. Those of us whose doctors may refuse to treat us. Those of us who are laughed out of eating disorder treatment because we look like you haven't missed a meal in a while. Those of us who are denied jobs solely due to our size. This isn't just about the way coating thin bodies as fat is damaging. It's also about how thin women equate negative body image with being fat and about the way fat people are deliberately excluded from these narratives. Going back to Amy Schumer, it's funny how in that Instagram post, she is aware that her body being considered fat or unconventional is a dangerous message to promote, but she also has a history of leaning into that false idea. In her Comedy Central show, Inside Amy Schumer, there were numerous sketches wherein Amy made jokes about her body and her looks. A whole episode was dedicated to a group of men arguing about how she isn't hot enough for TV. A big part of Amy Schumer's comedy is self-deprecation. So many sketches were dedicated to pointing out how Amy's body did not adhere to the body standards she was expected to live up to in Hollywood. I don't deny that Amy, along with many other straight-sized actresses, have experienced a form of body shaming in Hollywood, but she actively perpetuated the very things she was angry at Glamour magazine for doing. These thin women who think their bodies are unconventional feel their experiences are similar to those of actual fat people because they have internalized fat phobia. Yes, you can feel very real, very deep hurt, but that isn't the same thing as being systematically excluded from meeting your most basic needs because of your size. If you don't experience a particular kind of repression, it isn't yours to internalize. And despite the pain endured by many straight-sized people, that is, people who don't wear plus sizes, that pain isn't internalized oppression. She continues, When I share this information with straight-sized people, I met with a cacophony of objections. That's your opinion. You don't know what it's like to be me. You don't know what I've been through. They're right. I don't. But those objections often come from thin women, particularly thin white women, who struggle to conceive of oppression unless we are the target of it. Many white men are inclined to think that oppression isn't real, having escaped its crushing grip. Many white women, especially those of us who consider ourselves empathic, are inclined to think that oppression is real, but that we are the target of all of it. And when we claim that space, we erase and displace the many people who are intended targets of oppressive systems. Black people, indigenous people, people of color, disabled people, trans people, and in this case, fat people. Which are our feeling that compulsion to object might be a sign of what happens when your sense of neutrality is challenged. In the same way size zero models were seen as exemplary and actresses who were size six were seen as antithetical to that, we are continuing to exclude bodies that further deviate from the norm or what a lot of straight size people call average. The problem is their bodies are not average. Most women in America are size 16 and up. Most women do not possess the bodies we see on screen. Shocking, I know. This is why it was so eye-opening when This Is Us came out and the character Kate, played by Chrissy Metz, was introduced. It was truly astonishing to see an actual fat person as one of the leads in a critically acclaimed television show. Same would go for how I felt with Ruby and Good Girls. If fat white women are excluded from the media, fat women of color are even more excluded. Enter Lizzo, a fat black woman who proudly flaunts her body and causes every fat phobe on the internet to lose their fucking minds. We're all for body positivity so long as the person isn't too fat. We're fine with hashtag body positivity when the people we are celebrating have acceptable fat bodies. But anything that isn't able-bodied or anything that's higher than a size 18 is either excluded or shamed. I think we need to get to a point where we stop scrutinizing the bodies of not just celebrities, but regular everyday people. We need more representation of diverse bodies on television and in movies. I don't just mean fat bodies, but disabled bodies and trans bodies as well. We need to stop perpetuating body dysmorphia and fat phobia in the media. If you're going to have not fat character in a movie struggling with their body image, you need to make that clear. You need to critique it, not validate it. I also think it's important to point out how a lot of our conversations around fat shaming center around thin women who are fat shamed. I think we should always call out body shaming when we can, but thin women being body shamed has taken up way too much space in the discourse. Keep that same energy when a fat person is being fat shamed as well. And thin people need to start listening to fat people when they try to center themselves in conversations around body positivity. Again, that's not to say thin women who have struggled with self-esteem or eating disorders have no place in the movement. 
but it does mean that as a thin person, you need to remember how much privilege you hold. You need to remember that there are people with bodies more marginalized than yours. Body shaming is bad regardless of your size, but there are certain sizes that are treated worse and contain a whole host of problems that thin people will never have. You don't think the whole world isn't constantly telling me that I'm a fat piece of shit who doesn't try hard? Anti-fat bias affects fat people the most, obviously, but it harms all of us. If I Feel Pretty had better writers, it could have touched on this. It could have touched on these systemic ways women are told to hate their bodies. The ways we are told to fear fat and shame fat people. But it wasn't that. It's a clunky movie that pretends to have a wholesome message, but completely fails at everything it's trying to do. The fact that it ends with Renee literally selling body positivity to women in order to promote a brand is darkly parallel to what is actually happening in real life. The problem is the movie isn't self-aware enough to critique this. The way companies will try to sell body positivity to women by having straight size to mid-sized women on the face of their brand is a product of capitalism. And the way a radical movement started by marginalized people can get co-opted and made it more palatable for the masses. The whole thing was just Dove patting themselves on the back. Like, can you believe how brave we are <laughs> for putting these fucking dump trucks on television? In that speech that Renee gives about the ways women are taught to hate themselves, she makes it an individual issue. She says that Lily LeClaire won't change your life, which it won't but then continues by saying that This new line of products won't change your life. Only you can do that. And you can do that. Completely disregarding the patriarchal system that keeps women in these insecure prisons in the first place. The writers of this movie clearly just didn't have the range to tackle this. The conversation around anti-fat bias is still so contentious. Even a mention of fat phobia on the internet causes every fat phobe to pop out of a trash can and rant about shit they clearly haven't done much research on. Even the most leftist and progressive people still miss the mark when it comes to this stuff. Sadly, the way women see their bodies isn't exactly getting better, it's getting worse. But I am hopeful that the conversation around our bodies is getting better, but we still have a long way to go. This is some, this is horrifying, like a scary movie or something, like some nasty ass patriarchal bullshit. You know what? I gotta go apologize to some bitches. I'm forever changed after what I just seen.